So we'll invite Linda and Christina back. And so if you have questions, and again, just because of the videotaping, if you would raise your hand and we will bring the microphone to you. And just to also mention that these videotapes are Even going to be phone. available once they're edited on the Cure PSP website as well as CNI's website. So go for it. Hi, this question is for Linda. Have you any experience with balance vests? Balance vests. You're talking right. about. Correct. Um, yes, I've tried it on some different people. And I've actually, the research on the balance vests is um, not really promising. It, they found that once you take it off, you're, you know, you're kind of back where you were before anyway. Um, I think the trend has kind of been kind of away, moving away from balance vests and weighted, that sort of thing, from what I understand. Can, can I just add to that, though? We, we had someone who came in from, I think, California, and it's, I forget, it's BBTW, and it's, it's body balance weight, torso weighting, and it was a vest that you'd wear at all times, and it would have teeny weights in it. I'm talking like less than a pound, uh -huh. and you would do the testing, and you'd put them the on there, but it would be a permanent thing. You'd be wearing it at all times. It would not be something right. you'd do for training and take off. Right, yeah, d d exactly. It does not, doesn't really carry over, but I suppose if you're willing to wear it around all the time, you might find some benefit. They, they have very many stylish versions, I'm surprised, yes. Okay. Yeah. And actually, that kind of goes along with, um, I think it was Dr. Haug mentioned the wrist weights before. Um, with the wrist weights, it's not something you necessarily wear all the time, because if I'm just wearing it all day, you know, your body kind of gets used to it, almost like you've just gained a couple pounds, and then it's not as functional. So when we're w working with, like, wrist weights or something for dealing with coordination, then it's, okay, what tasks do I need to wear this um, for? So maybe I wear it while I'm doing my grooming so that my hand's holding still while I'm brushing my teeth, and maybe I wear it while I'm eating, and that's about it. And then I take them off and put them back on when I need them again. So just since we were on the topic of weights. I'll give a plug to the Cure PSP website. Um, as a caregiver, I would go in and I would um, look not just at the family information, but I'd look at the professional information. And from that came up one from physical therapy that um, had my husband in a, what do I want to call it? Uh, Body in a harness. Body weight support. Yeah, treadmill the harness system. and then um, yes. the treadmill and lower, slowly reducing his, or uh, lowering him onto the treadmill with more body weight, mm -hmm. and it did get him back up walking again. And so I was really glad to find that. And well, do you yep. use that much? Yes, we have one at CNI. We actually use it fairly often. Um, yes, in fact, I've got my patient right now with PSP on it, and we, it actually has a mechanism at the top that you can, uh, so we can kind of swing freely. So in, in addition to just not only walking forward, you can practice side stepping and walking backwards, you know, because falls tend to be posterior a lot of times, that it's, it's important to be able to take the backward steps. So and it's also nice to, like you said, you can take weight off a little bit and make it a little easier. It's a good way. We use them a lot for people with strokes, too. So. We've used an Alter-G on occasion for that, and that's a, a weight system that basically uses air pressure from below. It doesn't allow for the flexibility, and I think there's some definite changes in gait that I don't love. But we did have a gentleman who had camp decormia, so he was quite down in this position, and we put him in there, and he could actually use that to kind of hold him up there. And it was an idea I got from a movement disorders article that had a video of someone with a standing frame walker, so they were using that for camp decormia, which is pretty unusual. But it's another opportunity. We can calibrate it very well. We do have the biodex, and I think they like that because you can go sideways, and you can do quite a bit more with it. But it's another opportunity. For uh, voice uh, amplifiers, I know you were talking about it. Um, um, I is there anything that's really, really good that, so like my mom, her voice is almost gone, so it's like so hard to hear on the phones. Is there anything for a home phone and, a, and like a cell phone that you can really hear her a lot better instead of, you know, always saying what, 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 what? You're getting options OT-wise, or? I think you guys probably know more about that. Well, you know, there's a couple things that I think are coming, and then I'll tell you. I, I think an amplified phone is where I'd start if you're dealing with it on the phone. For the cell phone, not yet, but there was an interesting project um, with somebody out of MIT doing some work on assessing voice over the, and I, and I think that um, he was using the, the voice on the phone. I think that there could be a potential of building something that might not just amplify, but maybe be the right kind of bandpass filters to enhance the voice. 
Um, I don't think I see anything right now, but I could see that happening. In the near term, I think a, a personal amplifier is always great. I think um, a, an amplified telephone. But then there is something out there, um, it's called SIFT, S-I-F-T, and it's actually the same kind of filter I'm talking about, but it's only available in a big clunky system. I think, I hope they've digitized it and turned it into an iPhone app before too long. I, I wanted to ask you guys about um, swallow studies. I understand the purpose, I, you know, and, the, and the, the reason for them, but I guess I'm wondering, clearly if someone is having more coughing and choking and such during meal times, then it logically then seems time to modify their diet and make some changes. Is there anything other than the recommendation to modify a diet that a swallow study will be able to give us? Well, it's complicated because, I, I mean, the problem with a swallow study is it's kind of a picture at the time. So if I get a lot of people on their best behavior, or I get a lot of people who aren't on the right part of the medication cycle, well, it's more Parkinsonistic. Um, but there are times when you can see something in a swallow study that you can see residuals, which might have a different impact. So that'd be like I'm swallowing and my body doesn't give enough force and it doesn't go all the way down and it'll leave bits of food in, my, in the pharyngeal area. And that's different than if I had something in my mouth and the back of my tongue wasn't strong enough and all of a sudden some food got past my defenses early. So it could tell me a little bit about that, though I, I can get an awful lot of stuff by the bedside. Um, as far as the efficacy, I think, I don't know. I mean, I'm on both sides of it. It's a really one one time case. It's a personal decision, and your your speech therapist is going to add a lot to that. It also provides us a lot of information regarding structural and functional behaviors that we cannot see in looking at a person's diet. We can't see those things. So yeah. I, I was speaking about uh, diversity of opinion. I use those modifies very often to help guide what sort of intervention I'm going to provide for a person because you don't know what sort of compensation strategies are gonna work for that individual unless you see that. And, and if, the, if the modified is done properly, they should be also using some of those techniques during that evaluation to tell you, this really works. This minimizes the amount of re, uh, residue that person has. Or this technique or this change in head position really helps this person to keep their airway safe and protected. So it's much more. So it's more, very, very helpful. Much I more than I, just, oh, they're, they're I so, use it okay. in my diagnostic procedures. Thank you. And it, that might also be a bit of a function of working at a hospital, <coughs> working at a facility out in the, in the ether there, and that's uh, getting access to it. So if you can work with that, the therapist, we often uh, I, we'd recommend that. Again, I still think that I can find some of the same information and I send out for the modified to rule in or rule out, and then I try to, it will guide where the problem is and maybe what treatments I'm using. I take care of a lot of people with PSP, uh, mostly my dad, but I take care of other people too. What has disturbed me about this is that you guys have all done a great presentation, but you haven't talked about what happens later on when they can't use your, your machines or when they can't do the lunges or the exercises or when they can't eat by themselves or when they can't talk, um, like how you able to understand them. There are other ways that they can um, get their point across without you know, gadgets and stuff that come later. So what do you guys suggest for when they can't do, you know, the exercises or the speaking or the eating or the bathing or the, you know? Mm -hmm. Do you right. guys ever deal with people who've had um, PSP in the really late stages? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because they're all gonna get there and I just thought it'd probably be better if they knew, you know, what happens towards the end, like when my dad, where my dad is now. Right. Um, yeah, that's a good point. It's kind of it's hard to cover it the whole range. Um, you know, that's why I kind of mentioned too at the beginning that we have to develop a customized program. You know, almost anybody at any level can do some sort of stretching, moving, even even if it's somebody else doing helping them do it. Um, a lot of what we do is partnering with the caregivers, too, coming up with ways to maybe help you know, transfer them. If they're still living with their caregiver and they can't transfer by themselves, that's what we do as physical therapists also. We help instruct how to transfer somebody, that sort of thing. You're right, there really is a huge range. Um, so thank you for asking that question. Yeah, and, and that's something that's really specific too, based on what the specific person's needs are, as well as what the caregiver or the family member is able to assist with. 
Um, you know, sometimes the caregiver or the family member has their own physical limitations that are um, going to prevent them from being able to help in certain ways. Um, some often at um, CNI will have people, you know, who have a caregiver that works with them, you know, three, four days a week, and we'll say, well, bring them in with you one one time when you come to therapy, so we can go over what are those stretching exercises, what are those techniques for doing those transfers and things like that, so we can help train that person directly, so that they're helping the person in a way that's going to be safe for both of them, as well as being able to help with those exercise programs and things like that. But as far as specifically with things like the bathing and those types of things, it changes what types of equipment are sometimes beneficial. Um, it requires more increased assistance, whether that's a family member or bringing in an outside caregiver. Um, but there, you know, the techniques change, but there are still a lot of adaptive options out there. Um, you're just going to look at different ones early on in the process than you are later on. So, I don't know if everybody knows this or not, but when they get to the stages where they fall and the caregiver cannot pick them up, mm -hmm. if you call 911, tell the fire department that all you need is a pickup. Mm -hmm. They will come help you pick that person up and will not take them to the hospital. Mm -hmm. If you do not specify you just need a pickup, they have to take them to the hospital. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a great option. And there are various lift options out there that can be, um, some are more difficult to use than others, but there are options out there that a caregiver can be trained in a way to pick them up using some sort of adapted device as opposed to manually trying to lift them themselves, so. Uh, somebody asked the question, what happens when they reach a stage where you don't understand what they want? I don't mean to put you on the spot, Ruth, but, um, Ruth, that was, whose husband passed away from PSP, made, can you explain the booklet that you made where you and Jim were communicating with the, the book you made? This is with the advice of the physical therapist and the OT. But um, the book that I always had with him was just simply a photo book. And in the photo book, the first picture was a picture of him and said, my name is. The second picture was, my wife is Ruth, and this is her cell phone number, um, and just went through, or I need um, to get to a toilet. Basic pictures and um, life needs were put right there, so if I happen not to be there, I always had a fear we'd be in a car accident and I wouldn't be able to speak for him, that it was a very helpful tool, and we did not leave the house without it. to the woman who asked the question about end-stage um, issues. Do I really need this? Yeah. Use it. Um, talking about end-stage issues related to communication, as you modified what your husband could use effectively, that is what um, a speech pathologist does. So when you have people come back on a regular basis and their abilities are declining, then you have to modify, you have to scale back. And so we, we design communication devices to suit that person's abilities and what they really need to do in terms of basic communication. If it's just yes, no, if it's gestural, and regarding swallowing, if they can no longer swallow safely and they're constantly at risk for aspiration, which is a, an awful disorder for someone to have because they can be hospitalized for up to three to four weeks with that. Um, if it's necessary to downgrade to a peg, but to allow them maybe some oral intake for quality of life issues, it just depends on that person's situation and everybody is individualized. But if you have to modify for safety reasons than you do. Does that answer your question? Or is there something that else that? I'll let you know in a okay. Well, and that's where that suit up kind of mindset that we were talking about comes in too, where you don't just come in once and we give you some techniques and send you on your way. That's where we recommend people kind of come back in off and on down the road so that as those needs change and as those abilities change, we can problem solve through that and help just figure out with where we are now.
you were referencing Terry Ellis, uh, who was at the, the Boston one or the Braintree, and she talks about a dental model where you go in and see your dentist for regular checkups, and particularly with, with an atypical, with, with a PSP, MSA, or CBD, atypical diagnoses, that's a big deal. It's very important. It's also important for regular idiopathic Parkinson's, but more so for this population. Yeah, Bob? I have a question for Doc. Oh, boy, okay. I don't think you need a, I need a microphone, do I? Well, okay, I'll repeat it because you do. But go okay. Ahead. Um, in your program, with your team approach for atypical Parkinson's, do you use the power program like is used in Parkinson's disease? So if he asked if we use the power program uh, like we would do for typical idiopathic Parkinson's, and power is PWR. Parkinson's Wellness Recovery. I believe you hosted Dr. Becky Farley in 2011 at CNI. Yep. Um, so Becky Farley has a program that uses high intensity, high amplitude uh, movement. It's an exercise program. And I would say that we, we would do an adapted version because the movements are important. You're trying to show people how to increase the range of motion. And there's always ways to adapt that to whatever population because uh, there's even, uh, among people that have t traditional idiopathic Parkinson's, there's often a lot of comorbidities that you have to take care of, and that's a fancy term for they have back pain or they have peripheral neuropathy or they have something else. So yes, we definitely use, uh, I, I, I love uh, Dr. Farley's work, and I, and I try to interact with her whenever possible, so I'm biased, I'm, I'm very biased, but um, I do think it's a great program. We would just modify it. I have a question, and you may have covered this, so I apologize if you've already uh, I understand there's a new bill uh, regarding PT and OT and speech therapy that will extend uh, treatment for people with PSP and, and brain disorders. Um, if you're on Medicare, Medicare has a cap uh, yeah. for therapy. For Part B. And when you reach that, then uh, you can no longer go uh, for the therapy. And I understand there's a new bill that has been passed that that will extend it. You can qualify it if there's an, Im it doesn't have to show um, improvement or I, I can't use the right terminology, but do you know anything about it? Yeah. You know about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, that was recently passed. We don't know quite how it's going to work out in, in reality. Um, but I think that we all, in dealing with any chronic disease as therapists, we want there to be more to life than therapy. There's more to life than therapy. So if there is an active intervention that we can do, I think um, likely we can do it and get it covered and that we see you in these short periods of time for a number of visits. Um, but I don't think what Medicare is talking about is ongoing therapy every week, um, you know, for a whole year. So that's where we have to partner with community organizations for exercise classes, teach caregivers, um, have you do things at home, and that, you know, that's where quality of life is. It's not necessarily sitting in our clinics. Um, anything else, John, about that? Well, wasn't there a Supreme Court ruling earlier this year that talked about maintenance therapy? Maintenance therapy meaning we're not showing gains. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, I think, at the beginning. I, I mean, we've, we've talked about that. And we've tested it a couple of times. I'm, it, it'll take a while before we figure out yeah. how aggressive they're going to be in, in enforcing that. That's, it's great, though, because you can do therapy to maintain a level of quality of life and, and stability and not necessarily have to make the kind of gains that you would have to in order to justify therapy for Medicare traditionally. Although, like I said, that was earlier, maybe March or February of this year. So we're still figuring out how that goes. Yeah, it's not really tested yet, so we're yeah. working on it, but we're pushing the boundaries a little bit, yeah, I think. Yeah, exactly. But at the same time, just think about what are the quality of life things that you all can be doing, and it may not be coming to see us. Not that we're not great people, but... We're great. You know. <laughs> so I think we will thank um, John and Linda and Christina, and they'll be around. Thank you. Thank you. Great.